You're listening to Edge of Faith, a multimedia magazine where we discuss art and culture through a Christian lens. Well, so Gisela, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and share a little bit about your new book, The Soul of Wine, Savoring the Goodness of God. Um, how are you today? I am well, thank you, and I'm delighted to be with you, Michael. Yeah, me too. So why don't we just get started, and you could um, maybe start by telling the audience a little bit about um, yourself and your background, um, both as it pertains to wine and to uh, the spirit or your theological background. Yes, um, I think both of those Um, areas are really important in my life. On the one hand, I um, grew up in uh, Germany on a winery. So thinking about wine and agriculture has been part of my upbringing from the very beginning. And um, I think that has shaped me a lot in who I've become as a theologian and as a, a Christian in general and how I feel we need to live the Christian life. Um, so that that's really important. I grew up in the Lutheran tradition, which is um, um, a tradition that I think is very committed to um, thinking through things. That's one of the riches of my tradition, and that I really appreciate that. Um, and growing up on a winery and attending a church really brought the two worlds together for me. Um, My family made the wine for the Eucharist, and at every harvest Thanksgiving Mm. service, my mom would always decorate, help decorate the altar with the most beautiful grape clusters. And then there would always be wine tastings and reflection that had a little bit of spirituality in it. Um, And then also um, a lot of the villages, which are uh, villages where, um, you know, wine... Um, vineyards are it's surrounded by vineyards and um, there are a lot of vintners that are growing wine and then there's also a lot of spirituality mostly Catholic I grew up in a Lutheran village but it was always um, connected there are there were always these visual reminders um, wayside shrines in the vineyards and on the houses and the wineries and so there was I, I really come from a very very rich um, and quite ancient tradition of um, you know, the spirituality of wine, if, 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 if you want to call it that way now. Um, that's sort of my um, background, but I, um, I think very early on, well, the rest of my family is very practical, and two of my sisters became vintners. One of them runs the winery now with her family. I've always been the one that's asked questions about, you know, God, and I've always wondered how much is God actually involved in our lives? You know, how distant is he and how near is he and you know if something bad were to happen would god be involved in that somehow so from from very early on i've always wrestled with questions and i think that has stayed with me and sort of prepared me for um you know becoming a theologian and um, studying theology i studied theology in um at regent college in canada and i studied in germany at a at Catholic department, and then I studied uh, my PhD studies were at the University of St. Andrews. And I think that question of how much is God really involved in this earth and in our lives has stayed with me. And I think that <clears throat> is very much also what sort of um, helped me think about the spirituality of wine, is how much is God really involved in this earth? And um, are these things that we receive from the earth, are they sort of neutral ground or do they have spiritual meaning? So I think my upbringing, both growing up on a winery, but also growing up in a faith tradition that thought a lot about things and asked a lot of questions and wrestled with things, um, kind of brought me where I am today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... (laughs) I wish I'd grown up on a on a vineyard. That sounds awesome. Um, you know, as as I was <laughs> as I was reading your book, you know, I I was fascinated how much 
the Bible does talk about wine. I mean, of course, I knew a little bit, you know, of some of the topology of um, wine representing uh, forgiveness in the blood of Christ um, in the Old Testament. And then, of course, in the New Testament, where it, you know, literally represents the blood of Christ. But why don't you explain to us why or how wine is spiritual or at least how it is integral in the part of a spiritual mm -hmm. life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I always would like to start at the creation account. If we believe that God created this earth, if we believe that this is God's design and that the earth and what the earth brings forth is a gift from God, then that includes wine. Um, but even thinking about how wine is made, that you have to have bacteria in the atmosphere, you know, that sort of um, interact with the grape juice and um, cause it to ferment and be transformed into wine. That's a, a, an incredible reality to ponder. It's really miraculous. We, we, you know, we can explain a couple of things about the fermenting process, like sugar being transformed into alcohol, but there are so many metabolic pathways that work in fermentation that we haven't figured out. It's a great mystery still, even though we are so scientifically advanced. And so I see in all of these things God's handiwork. And so wine is, you know, um, is a singled out as a gift from God in Psalm 104 to bring us joy. So um, I think there is a continual theme in the Bible that sees all of creation, but wine in particular, uh, something that God wants to give us as a blessing and to bring us joy. And that's a theme that is thoroughly woven into the biblical narrative. And I think it comes to a climax in Jesus' first miracle. You know, people are wondering, who is this man? Who is he? Where does he come from? What does he want? And when he transforms um, all, the, uh, all the water in the purification, um, jars of purification into wine, and there's this massive amount of wine at a peasant wedding feast, um, this theme comes to a climax that God um, is benevolent towards humanity and he wants to celebrate with us that this life is a great gift. And the Old Testament prophets, you know, prophesied when God will send the Messiah, when he will redeem his people, there will be an abundance of wine flowing down the mountains. And um, so I, I see that as a very, very important moment in the New Testament where the theme isn't new or Oh, that's surprising. Jesus' first miracle is turning water into wine. But it really is the climax of a theme that has gotten stronger and stronger in the Old Testament, you know, until the latter prophets talk about this wedding feast and salvation to come and wine flowing in abundance. And then Jesus does it. He transforms water into wine, and there's this great feast and celebration to usher in um, the year of the Lord's favor. So there is a, a very, very, um, you know, a very strong um, stream in the Bible that talks about wine as a gift and has a particular purpose in our lives and to be a blessing from God so we can experience physically, emotionally, spiritually that God is benevolent towards us. And it also brings us joy. So I think that's um, really, really important but because of a history that I can't get into in this short interview, mm. we have forgotten about um, wine being a gift from God, and we now allow the secular world to define the meaning of wine for us. And that's unfortunate, because in the secular world, often wine is reserved for an elite group of people, or people who want to be really knowledgeable and talk about wine in a very specific way that can sound very Exclusive, exclusive, in a, in a very quickly, and mm. I think that's really, really sad because in the Bible, it's very clear that wine is a gift for everybody, whether you have a lot of money or not, whether you can be very sophisticated in your talk about wine or not. It's a gift for everybody, and it can be enjoyed on many levels. And you don't have to jump through all the hoops of naming certain things a certain way, and uh, learning that lingo of contemporary wine talk to then be on that insider group and to really appreciate wine. 
I really think that we have allowed the secular world to define the meaning of wine for us, and it's time to reclaim what belongs to the kingdom of God. Absolutely, yeah. It can, uh, it can definitely become uh, an arrogant thing. and I guess um, once anything becomes arrogant, then I guess it's not really blessing God anymore. Um, so maybe we can get a little more specific about the book itself, The Soul of Wine. Um, what can the reader expect, or at least you know, maybe tell us what your 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 goal is with the book? I think I wanted to write an accessible book that's also quite um, autobiographical for people to understand what does it mean that we reclaim wine as a gift from God, and not just as sort of a consumer product, but really as a gift from God that we are to integrate into our lives. Um, not just in sort of a wine tasting, but into our prayer life, into our life of hospitality and sharing, in rediscovering agriculture as a divine vocation, and um, and then also having some fun and um, learning to uh, do wine tasting as a spiritual practice at the very end of the book. I reflect a little bit of wine as a blessing, and then I do give instructions for a wine tasting as a spiritual practice. So it goes beyond what um, you know wine writers and wine specialists usually do in, in leading you into you know, discovering the flavor profile of a wine to add that spiritual dimension. So it really is a book for anyone who wants to learn about wine, and you can be very advanced in your understanding of wine, or you can be a beginner, it doesn't matter. But this book is for everyone who wants to understand the spiritual and cultural dimension of wine. And what, what does it mean to sort of bring that into our everyday lives? Right, absolutely. That's, that's very exciting, people. I mean, yes, anything that makes, makes your life um, a little more relational and a little more sharing and, and welcoming, I think that's great. Um, yeah, and that's not often that's not an easy task because our relationship with um you know food and wine is often fraught with difficulties and pain and struggles and that's sort of the mark of our time and i think it's really really important that we ask how can we allow god to redeem those places where we struggle with food or wine and i I reflect on that quite honestly because i've gone through some of those struggles and so i wanted it to be a book from, uh, I, I call myself a wine pilgrim. You know, mm. I don't want to sit up there and sort of say, well, this is preach it, people, and how to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm a pilgrim. I had to learn myself how to integrate in, that into my life. And um, one of my favorite chapters of the book is actually the last um, chapter. I think that's chapter um, 14, where I um, reflect on me moving to the U.S. for, um, you know, I, I taught at a seminary. And um, it was a very important experience because I moved into a culture where wine wasn't part of the church or the Christian culture. And so I, I had the opportunity to introduce some people here in the U.S. to how to do this. And that was such a great journey. I made some really good friends, and it was very, very fun to be sort of uh, a fellow pilgrim showing others the way and how to enjoy and savor these gifts and allow them to help um, us forge deeper friendship and community and hospitality. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a wonderful life and a, and a wonderful way to, you know, to have the opportunity to teach in such a fashion. Um, you know, the book, I'd like to mention it again, is The Soul of Wine, Savoring the Goodness of God. It's um, in a varsity press. Um, we're coming close to the end of our interview. Do you, do you have any final words you'd like to share with Edge of Faith before we conclude? Yes, um, I do. I mean, we um, we are in the midst of a pandemic. It's been really, really hard. Mm. I moved to the U.S. in February and got married, and we started off our married life together mm. um, during this pandemic. And I think it is so important that we transform these very ordinary and perhaps hard times into um, beautiful moments, you know, to, to make an effort to 
cook a nice meal and sit down together as a family or a couple or with a friend and to eat something good and to savor a glass of wine and to really cultivate a posture of joy and gratitude, even and especially in such hard times as we are in now. I think more than ever, we need to rediscover that there is a lot of grace and joy that can come from being around the table together and lingering so that the food and the wine can do a good work in us and uh, not to rush off too quickly to do other things. I think that's what me and my husband, what we have been doing, and that's been very, very helpful um, during a very hard time um, with this pandemic. So that's my um, maybe words of um, advice or how to sort of start drawing, you know, the spirituality of wine into the everydayness of our lives. I I think that's um, wonderful advice. You know, I've usually worked endless hours in the office and lunch is usually just grabbing something on the run or just sitting down and keep working. And during this pandemic, you know, I'm uh, in the house with my wife and both our college kids. And I've noticed now, like at lunchtime, you know, I like to cook, but I never cooked at lunch. Now I'll cook myself something rather than just grabbing a quick meal. But now I'm like, hey, would you like this? Would you like that? I'm constantly trying to cook and entertain and keep the family around the table. But uh, it does. It helps with the the relationships and um, it brings a certain little bit of peace in in this kind of horrible time. So thank you for for bringing that up. Yeah. I think it's it's such an obvious thing and it has helped cultures and um, societies and communities and families, you know, over, over... you know, thousands of years, and we actually have lost the art of the table, the gift of the table. It's disappeared for a lot of families, and I think this is a really, really important time to recover the table as a central piece of furniture and time together as a family. I think if there is something good that is coming out of this, that we need to rediscover and really hold on to the table, move away from the TV and the screens and all of that for time, and gather and connect and ask how was your day how are you doing and savor and um i'm i'm very very glad that so many people are rediscovering it absolutely well gisela thank you again for um sharing time with us and and for writing this wonderful book thank you yeah i'm it's a delight to talk sure absolutely And, and it's wonderful to hear what you have to say all right well god bless Um, Blessings to you. It was lovely to talk, Michael. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.